Here I want to look at some nice relations between standard and hyperbolic trig functions. So let's start with their derivatives. So they have a pretty similar derivative relationship. So the derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Whereas the derivative of the hyperbolic sine is the hyperbolic cosine. The derivative of the hyperbolic cosine is the hyperbolic sine. So they have this nice looping effect under the derivative where you go from sine to cosine and back. You pick up a minus sign in the regular trigonometric part, but you never pick up a minus sign in the hyperbolic trigonometric part. Okay, so now let's look at the Pythagorean identity for regular trig functions. So that would be sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. So there's a similar identity for hyperbolic trig functions, and that is hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared is equal to one. Then next, let's look at their relation to exponential functions. So there's a well-known relation between trigonometric functions and complex exponential functions. So we've got Euler's famous formula, which says e to the i x is cosine x plus i sine x. Well, if we take the i out of the exponent on the left-hand side, we have e to the x is hyperbolic cosine plus hyperbolic sine. Well, today I want to look at some other relationship between the trigonometric functions and the hyperbolic trigonometric functions that's a little bit more geometric. So let's say we've got a unit circle. So it's well known that that can be parametrized with cosine x sine x, where x is this angle from the positive x-axis. So in other words, x is this angle right here. Okay, well, let's maybe start by finding the area of that region. And just for fun, I'm going to find the area of that region using a double integral. So we know the area of that region will be equal to the double integral over that region, which I'll just put as this sector of this circle like that, of our differential area component. Now that region is most easily described in terms of polar coordinates. So I can write this as the integral from zero to one, the integral from zero to x of r d theta dr. So my theta value is going from zero to x and my r value is going from zero to one because I have a circle radius one and my sector has angle theta. So let's see what we get for this that can decompose into the integral from zero to one of r dr and the integral from zero to x of just d theta. Okay, but now the integral from zero to one of r dr, that's just gonna be one half, and then this is going to be x. So that gives us x over two. Okay, now I wanna compare that area with a similar area for a unit hyper hyperbola. So that can be similarly parametrized with hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. But this area is a little bit trickier to find. What we'll do is first extend this to the area of an entire triangle. It's easy to find the area of a triangle. And then we'll subtract the area of that green part. Okay, so let's maybe do that. So since we're finding two areas, I'm going to go ahead and rename this area 1. And then this will be called area two. So like I said, that's going to be the area of this entire triangle minus the area of that green part. But what's the area of that entire triangle? Well, I can just use my formula one half base times height. So I have one half hyperbolic cosine of x times hyperbolic sine of x. So notice the base is hyperbolic cosine and the height is hyperbolic sine. That's pretty obvious. Okay, now we just need to find the area of this bit right here. So how can we do that? Well, we need to express this as some sort of plane curve instead of a parametrized curve. That's a bit tricky, but if I let this be the t-axis and maybe we'll let this be the u-axis, you can eliminate the parameter here to see that the equation right here is equal to u equals the square root of t squared minus one. 
Okay, so in order to find that green area, we need to integrate from one to this end point right here, which is hyperbolic cosine of x of the square root of t squared minus one. So let's do that. So here we'll do minus the integral from one to hyperbolic cosine of the square root of t squared minus one dt, like that. Now, how would we calculate that integral? Well, probably using some sort of trigonometric substitution. That would be the standard way to calculate that integral. So let's do that. Here we'll say t is equal to secant theta. That means dt is equal to secant theta times tangent theta d theta. Okay. But that means for this area two, we have this bit, which I'll rewrite as hyperbolic cosine x times hyperbolic sine x over two minus my new integral, which will have different bounds of integration, but I won't calculate those. I'll just change everything back at the end. So I'll just put little blue squares there to remind myself to calculate these at the end or to change back at the end. Then I have t squared minus one, well, secant squared minus one is tangent squared. I need to take the square root that gives me tangent times dt, but dt is this. So that gives me tangent squared theta times secant theta d theta like that. Now, how can we simplify that? Well, we probably wanna take that tangent squared and rewrite it as a secant squared. So just as we saw before, tangent squared is secant squared minus one. So we've got this is equal to hyperbolic cosine of x times hyperbolic sine of x over two minus the integral between these unknown endpoints of secant cubed theta minus secant theta d theta, like that where I get that from distributing my secant theta onto my secant squared minus one, again, using that trigonometric identity. And now we're at the point where we need to take the following trigonometric integral. But since this video is mostly about comparing hyperbolic and standard trigonometric functions, I'll let you guys calculate this integral on your own. There are a bunch of YouTube videos for how to do that. So what we get here is that this will be minus one half and then t times the square root of t squared minus one minus the natural log of the absolute value of t plus the square root of t squared minus one. And then we need to evaluate that from one to our hyperbolic cosine. Okay, so let's jump from that step up here and then we'll finish it off. Okay, on the last board, we ended up at the following spot, and now we're ready to do this evaluation. So I'll just bring this down. We've got hyperbolic cosine x times hyperbolic sine x over two minus one half. Now we need to plug hyperbolic cosine in here. So here we'll get hyperbolic cosine and then the square root of hyperbolic cosine squared minus one. But using this identity right here, the hyperbolic cosine squared minus one is equal to the hyperbolic sine. So that means that when we take the square root, we just get the hyperbolic sine. So just to reiterate, I've got hyperbolic cosine times hyperbolic sine, and that's for this term right here. Okay, and then likewise, I can do that for this second bit. I'll have the natural log of, that'll give me the hyperbolic cosine plus the hyperbolic sine. Now, what happens when we plug in one? Well, in fact, if we plug in one, we get zero. Here we get one minus one, which is zero, and there we get the natural log of one, which is zero. So we don't need to worry about that. Okay, so where can we go from here? Well, now I wanna notice that I've got half hyperbolic cosine times hyperbolic sine minus half the same thing. So that means I can cancel these out. Then next, I can distribute this minus sine through to cancel, and that'll leave me with one half the natural log of this hyperbolic cosine plus hyperbolic sine. But as we noticed before, that's equal to e to the x. So we have natural log of e to the x. But natural log of e to the x is just x, 
So in the end, we get x over 2, which is the same area that we got for our circle. So that gives us a nice geometric relationship between this standard trig function and the hyperbolic trig function to go with these maybe more common relationships. And that's a good place to stop.